I'm gonna explain to you real quick. Continue walking. Like, don't be rolling yet. Don't yet. There's a reason for it. So last time I was uh, in San Diego, I went to the Secret Knock, your event, and we'll talk about it in a second. I know that you have one coming up in March. Um, I mean, I think you should just tell people what Secret Knock is, because I can't really describe it, but it's like a secret knock in a sense you don't know where where it's going to be, right? Yeah. So as a uh, history, I write books, right? And I right. interview the most amazing, positive people, travel around the world to find out what they did to create a life of sustained abundance. And people said, how do I meet your friends? So I started my living room with just 12 people and it grew exponentially and became Forbes Inc. Entrepreneur's top event uh, for networking and meeting amazing human beings. When I went there, I was mesmerized by how many people were there. And what was strange is the famous people were sitting in the audience. Right. Like you had famous people who I thought would be on stage and like people that were heads of pharmaceutical companies and and uh, Carol Baskin, which I still don't know how that happened. And uh, the Hemingway family, Meryl was there. I, I was like, wait, this is like, I, I couldn't really move around. There were so many famous people there. So you say it's your friends, but they're like in the audience when I was just sitting there, People that kind of blew me away were just listening to what was going on. Yeah, I believe that we're a reflection of the people we hang around the most. Our income, attitude, lifestyle is the average of the group. And if you hang around champions, you become one too. So I surround myself with people I have respect for, not people I have influence over. And I think that's a big misnomer. So many people look at Instagram and see these so-called guru celebrities that are talking it, but they're not achieving the actual destination. Mm -hmm. They're not a credible source. And I think it's important to make sure that you get your information from people who have actually accomplished what other people are just talking about. Yeah, I was, I, not only was I mesmerized by the event, but then you had me, when I spoke, you had me commit to something, this tub of love. Oh, the tub of love is great. And, uh, and then people used it. Yes, that's the best part. Yeah. yeah. I, so this is where people like give something. Yeah. Our whole concept is it's all about reciprocation, right? Sure. So we invite amazing people like yourself and other people you mentioned before, and we do a giant tub. Literally, it's just a plastic tub on stage. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we ask each person to donate a book, a product, a one-on-one -on -one business consultation with them, and we mm -hmm. put it inside the tub. And as it grows at the end of the event, we choose one person from the audience and they receive everything. And it's so cool to see the people actually apply and do something with that content. Hmm. Yeah, it was uh, that concept of the idea. And it was weird, the people in the group uh, that were part of the audience kind of like, we're calling for you to put something in the tub of love. They're That's almost right. like peer pressure. Yeah, well, they all want to be part of it, but also you give so much value. You know, what's common sense to us is genius to somebody else, mm -hmm. where we sit there and think, hey, this is what I'm doing on a daily activity. Other people are thriving and thirsting for that knowledge. So by even giving an hour of your time, the calls that I got back, the feedback has been mesmerizing. I, I will tell you, that's the uh, thing that was weird to me is, I've only heard that from you. I mean, can you say it again? So what's common sense to us is genius to someone else? Correct. Is that it? It is so simple. And it's, a, it's a really simple process of me not really thinking that was the case because mm -hmm. I deal with what I deal with every day. And I think what you're doing is genius. I don't deal with what you deal with every day. So I get the point. I mean, it made logical sense to me, right? Yeah. Bob Proctor and I did a book uh, together. It's called Thoughts Are Things. And he gave me a greatest insight. He said, how do you get paid money to do what you're already going to do? I went, What? He goes, look, you're going to write a book and you went and interviewed all these people. How many people came along with you on the journey? I said, none. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I'm going to write my follow-up book and I charge people like 25 grand to go along that quest to meet all these amazing human beings. And there was a line out the door and I go, holy smokes, I was going to do it anyway. And then I said, you know what? I like jumping out of airplanes and running with bulls and swimming with sharks. So I started an adventure club mm. and for X amount of money, guess what? You get to jump out of an airplane and run with bulls and swim with sharks. How do you get paid money to do something you're already going to do? Because what's common sense to you is genius to someone else. Yeah, that makes sense. It's really, uh, it's really simple, but it, it makes uh, it makes a lot of sense. You know, I I would many years ago now. I got to say, it's probably thirty something years ago, maybe 
maybe even 35 years ago, read Napoleon Hill, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. Oh, yeah. I read the original, like the original version, not like Think and Grow Rich and Beyond, all these other versions of them, which I guess are kind of, those are your versions, right? Correct. Oh, you're writing those ones. Well, I did Think and Grow Rich, th- uh, Thoughts Are Things. Uh, we did Napoleon Hill's Road to Riches, Three Feet from Gold. Uh, Sharon Lecter did Outwitting the Devil, Think and Grow Rich for Women. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, there's something I want to touch on. And you and I were talking about this offline. And you know, it's one of the greatest discoveries I've learned recently. And it's called C. PC. Can I share it? Sure. CPC is an acronym. If I could turn back time to I was 20 years old, this would be the message I told myself. CPC stands for clues, C, patterns, P, choices, C. It's about accountability and responsibility for everything that happens. We got to stop blaming other people. It's our fault. So many people cast blame when they don't look at themselves. I'm a single guy. And let's say I go out on a first date. The woman's amazing. She's 20 minutes late. Anything could happen, but there's a little red flag. That's the first C. It's a clue, but I like her. And I keep going out on a date. And on the 10th, 15th, 20th date, she's always 20 minutes late. Mm -hmm. That forms a P, which is a pattern. Mm -hmm. Now it's my C, my choice, whether I deal with it, I yell at her, I break up, but it's not her fault. She's just late. We have to stop trying to change people to fit into our own little paradigm box. No one wants to be changed, but we'll see a person with a bad reputation. They cheat your best friend. You do business thinking it'll be different. When things go wrong, you're mad at the person. You saw the clue. You saw the pattern. You made the choice. It'd be like seeing a rattlesnake rattle, bite your kid's sister. You pet it, get bit, and you're mad at the snake. Looking back in life, we'll never be angry at relationships that failed or negotiations that fell through. We're mad at ourselves because we stayed in too late. Well, you know, I have an acronym. You know, I have a book coming up and a, an acronym, Risk On, which the O in Risk On is Own Your Own Mistakes. Right? Yes. It's a really, I, CPC, a choice, and a, uh, CPC. clue, pattern, choice. That's right. That's, that's all it comes down to. And also, who's getting the results that you want? I'm so frustrated when people go to people who've never been on a stage before and they charge them money to be a stage speaker. It makes no sense. Or how to write a best-selling book and they've never written a best-selling book. Mm-hmm. They're not a credible source. It's about surrounding yourself with people who are doing what you want to do. Right. When I wrote my first best-selling book, I went to Barnes & Noble and I bought every best-selling book. And I called that author and said, teach me the system. I didn't go to the best written book section. I didn't want to be a great writing author. I'm dyslexic. I said, hey, what's the system for selling books? And they taught me. I applied it. And here we are today. If we would surround ourselves with people who are doing and not just talking, we'll never look back. It's interesting because, you know, when Napoleon Hill wrote that book, he didn't have a uh, thing grow rich. He didn't have the Internet. He probably used a typewriter. I think, He did. Probably. I got it. I was sat at that typewriter. Um, he wrote in a different dialect you know it's like a different when you when you listen to it it's like the english is different right um and yet that book is probably the most one of the most iconic things ever about how to achieve wealth and be successful. A hundred percent. And when he first wrote that, he was a 23 year old aspiring magazine reporter Mm. and he gained access to the richest guy's name was Andrew Carnegie. Right. It was supposed to be a 30 minute interview turned out to be three days and nights. And Mm. at the end of the interview, Carnegie says, I like you. And here's an opportunity. He said, work for me for free for 20 years. And I'll send you on a mission to meet my friends. You'll sit down, pick their brain, and write the first ever formula for success. Napoleon Hill reached in his pocket, didn't even have two nickels to rub together. It says, Mr. Carnegie, not only will I accept that, I'll complete the task. Carnegie says, fine, you got yourself a job. Hill says, why are they going to talk to me? I'm a kid. I'm nobody. I'm not connected. He says, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. When they see it, they'll know I sent you, give you all, all the time you want. Sat down with Edison, Einstein, the Fords, the Rockefellers, and wrote the 20th best-selling book. But here's where it gets really cool. Carnegie was a stickler for action and gave Napoleon Hill 60 seconds to make up his mind to work for free for 20 years. And when Napoleon Hill said yes, he pulled out the stopwatch he began in his pocket. There was 31 seconds left. He made a major life-changing decision in just that short period of time. But here's the best part. Carnegie made that same offer to over 250 men before Napoleon Hill. He was the only person to say yes. Everyone else had a bad case of the one size. 
I'm going to take action once I get the big break, once I get the kids out of the house. But it's the people that are gifted the golden opportunity and take action. They're the ones that we tell the stories about. What do you call it? Once, once eyes? Yeah, it's like once eye. You know, have you oh, ever once seen eye. that? Yeah. Once eye, once I do this, once I Bad do that. Bad case of the once eye. People say, what's the big thing that holds me from success? Your big butt. I don't mean the one we're sitting on. I'd go do that too, but. Once eye, yeah. That's it. By the way, I've heard that a ton of, a ton of it, a ton of that uh, scenario where they say, once my kids are out of the house, exactly. I'll start this or what. And, and I, I, the ironic part is I probably have not had a lot of one size in my life. I just go do them. And people think I'm crazy. Like I'm like, I, when I started Alzheimer's in Neuro, I said, literally I said, I'm sitting on the couch with my daughter. I see the show on TV, uh, on CNN. And I said, okay, I'm going to start an Alzheimer's company. Try to cure Alzheimer's. I wasn't one size. But I've had some one size before too. Yeah, but how many times have you had a million dollar idea in the shower? By the time you brush your teeth, it's down the drain to see it on a billboard 10 years later and say, hey, there's my idea. Yeah, the I could have. Yeah, yeah, the only difference is, right? Someone right. was waiting for the perfect time. Right. Wow. Well, how many books have you written? I've been part of 140 books, 45 different languages, and yet I'm dyslexic. I can't spell very well. I can't read. Play me words with friends. You win every single time. And the secret is you work your strengths and you hire your weaknesses. So mm -hmm. I'm a good orator. So I set my ghost writers down. I tell them these great stuff, and they give it back to me so people would want to read it. So how do people go to... Uh Secret Knock. Well, you go to secretknock.co. We left the M off so people couldn't find it at the dot .com, but they still did. Uh, and like I said, we started with 12 people in our living room, and now we are just blowing up, selling out six months you know, in advance every single time. Secretknock.co. Correct. And the idea is, again, there's no name tags allowed, and our only rule is be cool. And what that means is, look, if water runs out on the table, don't complain. Get your butt up. Go get some water and bring it back to other people. Treat everyone the way that you'd want to be treated. Your life will never be the same. Don't complain. That's right. Just be cool, right? What would it be if everyone's just cool and own their own situations? Stop blaming accountability, CPC. Um, clue. Uh, pattern. Pattern. Choice. That's it, baby. CPC. <laughs> clue, pattern, choice. You didn't get to go to Secret Knock, did you? Yes, I did. I I did. You did? <laughs> yeah, and I told you afterwards it was my favorite conference we've ever been to. Oh, were you with me? I, yep, I definitely was there. That was when I went to SeaWorld. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember because yeah, I went there I went there with uh, Christy and Jeanette, uh -huh. and then they kind of sat in the front row. That was a weird experience, right? Yeah. Because they came in later. They sat in the front row. I think you were with me. I think maybe Roland, even, was, there Roland was there, too. Roland was there, too. He was, yeah. I loved that conference. It was cool. Just the, the layout of it, it felt, I don't know, so high-end. Because we've been to a lot of conferences. And it just felt so high-end and exclusive and then cool. It, it like was you said, really like it was high-end. Cool. Like it, it, it felt like something, I don't know how you did it. It was so it, well put together, yeah, too. It was amazing. It was a very, uh, uh, what was more interesting, too, is that you had some like people that were pretty hardcore about us not talking during the speaking. Because you know people would kind of break off from oh, it yeah. and stuff like that. But it was almost like an endless supply of people showing up. You yeah. had you've had some really amazing. How do you get them on the on the at the show? How do you get them to Secret Knock? I ask. That's much really so, complicated stuff. You just yeah, you yeah, ask them. I, I ask, and it's again the most successful people are also the most available. I know it's so weird, but it's true. The most successful people are the most available people. If you're brand new at something, you're happy go lucky. You're fresh. You're cool. If you're you know at the beginning stages, you're happy go lucky. You're fresh. You're cool. But if you're in the middle, you're filled with ego, you're a pain in the neck, and you're edging God out. And I realized that I just jumped to the front of the line. So if I'm reading a magazine about string theory, I'm going to reach out to that person and say, I'd love to interview you and share you with my tribe. And they jump on an airplane and come out to share their latest discoveries. Mm. And it's cool because it's a win-win for everybody. Do you have an agent? Because like, how would somebody else go about getting a hold of these people? people that we would find influential or Todd would find influential. Well, uh, great. You asked credible yeah. .com is one of the greatest websites you can go to because it'll give you the exact direct <laughs> access to the people uh -huh. everyone else is just talking about. Gotcha. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You're a talented guy. Yeah. So what are you working on right now? Like what's <laughs> you got the next one coming up the 21st through the 23rd. 
5 p.m. to 11 p.m.? Is that each day? Correct. So what we do is we go one day, and after it's done, we do networking so people can hang out and get to know each other. Day two, we end, and we do something called the Gifting Lounge, which you know. And it's downtown San Diego, and this year we rented out the Star of India. It's the oldest selling vessel in America. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. what we're going to do is we're, we're going to have pirates and, and wenches on there, and we're going to set it up where all the authors and speakers give away all their product. Uh, that's why we're having amazing people sponsor it so that they can give it away. And then on day three, we end at one and come back at that evening for the soiree. And that's a sexy little, uh, kind of like a red carpet Hollywood meets San Diego. It's fascinating. And, but, but the event is 5 to 11 each day. It's from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. each day. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So that way it's a full day activity. Uh, like I said, in at e at e each evening, people have a way to come back and a reason to do so. Most of these people want to network. But the only thing that's different, like I said, we don't have name tags. We don't have that type of energy. So it's up to you, your responsibility, your CPC to go out and reach across the table because I guarantee you a millionaire, a billionaire, or a celebrity sitting across I've been there. From you. I've been there. Some of the, I mean, I, they're some of the most famous people. Trust me, I, I mean, you know them, and you, you're, it's your event, but for the audience watching, I, I have been there. It's not like, um, I've been to some events where they say they're going to be there, and they're there, and well. But they're the, not present. And the average person doesn't have access to them. I've right. had some access to them because I've known the person putting it on, so it was like, got to go backstage. But the average person didn't have any access. Right. Um, and I'm talking about some big events, right? Where you think you're paying to go see them, but you're really kind of blocked off and they don't let you see them. And it's like, that's not the same. This is, this vibe is like, um, be cool. Everyone knows each <laughs> that's other, right? no name tags. That's it's right. a, and, and by the way, you kind of have to know the person. Like if you, when you introduced me to Carol Baskin, I was on stage. It was before you and I were going to go live and she walked by and said, Hey, I'm Carol. I'm like, don't I know you? You seem so familiar to me. She goes, yeah, I'm Carol Baskin. I'm like, and I was shit. Like, I could, like, because I had seen her on that show for so long, and it was like a, a stopping moment because you thought you knew her, mm -hmm. and you did, but you didn't know her. That's right. And then all of a sudden, you did. She had no name tag. She was kind of right there. And, and that's a trivial thing because obviously there were so many other famous people there that, or, or business people like the guy who founded Ugg Boots who I found really likable. Oh, Brian yeah, Smith's an Brian amazing Smith. human being. You know, it's one of the interesting things about the whole concept is we realize that where could your life be by surrounding yourself again with people that are doing what everyone else is talking about? So our, our events is strange. It's George Costanza opposite day. If you ever watch the Seinfeld. Yeah. So the way it works is it costs thousands of dollars to go, but we won't tell you where it is or who will be there. Right. Nothing. So every guest doesn't have a clue who's going to be there or even where it's going to be at. You just have to have faith. We tell you the cities, the state, the date, so you can make a hotel reservation and then that's it. And then we leak it. The reason we did is we did a private Skype, for example, with Edward Snowden while he's hiding in Russia. Mm -hmm. We brought in President Vicente Fox. He didn't want Secret Service, and he told us how George Bush tried to convince him to go to war in Iraq. Last time we brought Carol Baskin. This time we're bringing in someone that's the most controversial we've ever had. You know who it is, but it's unbelievable. And the way that we can do that is because it doesn't become public until afterwards who attended. But it's who I think it is. That's going to be a really crazy. It's going to be crazy. I'm going to yeah. tell you right now. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be pretty wild. Um, what's the cost to go? It's $3,000 the first time, and it's half that for alumni to come back. Right. But we mix it 50-50. So, for example, if we just want to bring alumni, we could sell it out every single time. Right. We always want 50% of people that have never seen us before. Right. And the way we do that, so that way people can network once again, it's all about networking and making connections. Yeah, I would. Yeah, and I, by the way, some people who took me up on the tub of love, they actually went to my events, and I actually ended up working on a deal with one of them. So, it's, nice. it's believe me, it's it, I can see that's the case. $3,000 is very inexpensive relative to like, if you went to some events that are held, like these 10X events, I think tickets, uh, okay, so why am I bringing up that? I'm not I'm not bashing in any way. Grant, has, Grant runs a big event. But you're in a stadium with thousands of people and you're paying 30,000 for the front row, 10,000 for like maybe a couple rows back. You're paying three grand for yours and it is- You're having tacos. You're, that's, you're, you're that's eating, all you're eating like we're right next to the per I'm like right here. That's I mean, it. Like, and there's no like, no one hidden there. It's mm -hmm. a strange, um, 
I, you pull off something I've never seen. I appreciate that. Well, let me give you the greatest aha and takeaway that we ever did there. We had a gentleman named Frank Shankwitz come. Uh, you probably didn't never heard his name, but he started a nonprofit called Make a Wish Foundation that grants wishes to terminal kids. And we're on stage and I go, Frank, I go, I got to ask you, what was your wish? And he looked at me like I had two heads. And he goes, what? I go, well, what was your wish? You're the founder of Make a Wish. He goes, no one asked me. I said, what? I go, I want to be the guy that grants the wish of the founder of Make-A-Wish. What do you want? Anything you want, I'm going to give it to you. And he says, I just want my story to be told so my grandkids will know I did something. So he signed over his life rights and I said, Frank, I'm going to make this into a major movie. Just know I've never made a movie. (laughs) And he trusted me. There you go. It took six years of trials and tribulations. But when it came out in 2019, we trended for two years on Netflix and we actually made the shortlist for the Oscars. And his whole message was that everyone can be a hero, meaning you don't have to be a millionaire or a billionaire to leave a positive impact. Everyone can give a pair of socks to a homeless person or stop a bully from fighting. Everyone can do something to leave the world a little bit brighter place wow 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 yeah i knew that story and now you were you kind of have to remind me a little bit but i remember that story yeah uh, those are the type of things how long have you been doing secret knock going on 17 years sold out staying room only every time and no one knows about it it's a 17 years 17 years isn't that unbelievable I didn't know that. I thought yeah. it was like a couple of years. No, we've been going for 17 years. Again, we started in my living room, and then we kept growing and growing and growing. And what we do is however many seats the venue will hold, that's what we sell. So if it holds 600, we sell 600. If it holds 400, 400. This next one's only 240. We have like 18 seats left, literally, and then we're sold out. I guess by the time you watch this podcast, you're kind of screwed. Sorry. <laughs> you have to go 2024. You, you, don't, you don't stream it, do you? No, absolutely not. The whole idea only is- Only live event. Only live event. And we don't even show video from the event. It is a secret. Know why? These people can come without filter and say, this is the way it works. Yeah, you didn't have cameras in there, did you? We, we have cameras only to go back to do little clips, but we don't actually share the content. We never have. And all the years I have it on yeah, terabytes yeah. and it's just sitting there and no one's ever seen it. Yeah, I don't remember seeing content. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And that's the reason why. Because again, uh, President Vicente Fox can go, look, let me tell you the exact story behind the story. It's his secret. And that's the whole idea. We don't want people to come up and tell me how I'm going to be rich. We want t- people to tell the exact steps that they did to create a life as a state in abundance. That's What's your secret. favorite sort of person that's ever been there? It's like picking your favorite child I right know. there. I know. So uh, Carl Kenai, the guy who started street uh, wear, you know, all the baggy clothes for uh-huh. hip hop. He was an amazing person seeing what's all that's possible. Uh, but just last time, I think Scott Parazinski, he's a one person. He's a doctor. Talk about being a proud mom. So a guy grew up, became a doctor, then an astronaut. He's the only person to ever climb uh, Mount Everest and then walk in space seven times. Wow. Talk about living a life, right? Right. Imagine at a party going, yeah, my son's a pediatric or whatever. I can go, yeah, my son's a doctor too. Well, my son, you know, just got a new car. Mine walked in space. You know, it's like yeah, a whole exactly. different conversation. Exactly. That's yeah. your, probably your favorite, you're saying? I liked it because he's so humble. Everyone that comes, as you saw, are just normal people and hanging out and telling their stories. And what's interesting is the imposter syndrome, how we all feel of like, how did I get so fortunate yeah. to have this success? Yeah, I have a little. I've, I've been reading about imposter syndrome a little bit. I think I have it. I think I have it. Mm. Yeah, a little bit. I'm a little weirded out recently. I've uh, we opened up a hotel in New York City that we started like six years ago, through COVID, through bankruptcy, through. I mean, just imagine owning a hotel under construction during COVID in New York City. Wow. Yeah, it's like I saw pictures of that place. It's insane. Yeah, it, it's it's really insane. And um, when I was there with Skyla. And uh, massively famous guy was there, uh, Mick Jagger. And, it, and I won't go any further. There were tons of other people. But if you see Mick Jagger, you can say you saw Mick Jagger, right? And I was thinking, how do you dig a hole, build a hotel that's like kind of almost immediately iconic? It's right in the heart of Tribeca. Um <laughs> Because you know what? You uh, asked. <laughs> yeah, I did. I was like, like, wow, this is weirding me out a little bit. You mm-hmm. know, it still weirds me out. I mean, we're having an event there um, with Anthony Scaramucci. I'm like, okay, well, how do you get Anthony Scaramucci to go to your hotel? Well, you ask. 
you ask. It, it, mm-hmm. That right there is the difference. I met a multi-billionaire one time, Paul J. Meyer, and he says, your success is in direct proportion to your ability to withstand a no. And so what do you mean? He says, well, if you're willing to ask enough ladies out, eventually you'll get a date for the dance. And so that's the mindset. How can you keep going down you know, the path that you want to lead mm. and not letting other people tell you what you can and cannot do? Yeah, my wife, who I met when I think she was 32, um, worked at a hedge fund with me. She was, uh, I think she was in accounting or something. Uh, she had left Disney. And uh, I could tell that she was, you know, she's a very pretty girl, tall, six foot tall, blonde, skinny then, really skinny then. Like, really, like, that 32-year-old, like, bombshell kind of girl, right? Um, and there were a bunch of hedge fund guys that worked at the place, right? And I could tell that they all knew her. And when I said to her, I told her about this wine bar, and she said, I said, you really got to try it. I'd love to go someday. I depressed her until she gave me an answer that night where, when, when we could go. And I kind of wondered why she had not went out with anybody else there because she was single. Not one person ever asked her out. Wow. Not one person said. I've seen your wife. I just thought you knew hypnosis or yeah, something. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, because yeah, way out of your league exactly, there, bud. I don't exactly, know how you pull that one off. Exactly. Um, so literally no one asked and when I was in high school, I went out with a girl who was a basic, literally homecoming queen. And I remember asking her out when I was a sophomore. And they're like, my friends were like, how the hell did you get her to go out with you? I'm like, I asked. That's right. She said the same thing. No one asked her. Mm-hmm. Um, I know a super famous supermodel. She, in fact, she just texted me this morning because she's going to the hotel. And uh, she's single. And she says no one asked her out. Wow. I think I got to get on an airplane ride. I'm a single guy. Back to yeah. my thing. Just don't be 20 minutes late. Yeah, but the, I, the ironic part is that not a lot of people ask. That's right. Right? Uh, they're just like, I don't, you know, or they don't ask for the money, the help, the idea. Can they go? You know? And remember this. Rumi, the philosopher, had a great quote. Whatever you seek is also seeking you in return. Yeah. So where we're sitting there saying, I need an investor, someone else is saying, I've got some money I need to invest. Someone saying, I need a date to the dance. Someone else is saying, I hope someone asked me out for the dance. Right. So whatever you seek is seeking you. When you line those energies, amazing things happen. So I'm a huge, uh, you know, basically believer in manifestation. And mm-hmm. ironically, you know, once I met you, I kind of seeked you out a little bit. We kind of connected. Then I asked you to help me on a project. But I wonder one thing I want to ask you, I've actually wanted to ask you this uh, before, is there's this thesis that, we could all be in a simulation. Even even Elon Musk says there's a 99% possibility that we are in it, not that we're not in it, right? Uh, it does seem strange to me that I just say or think things and they seem to pop up. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you make of that? The Polian Hill talked about that scenario i believe it's a law of vibration is it, it yeah it's whatever you put out again it, you you get in reflection back so there was a movie out years ago called the secret and it's all yeah, about yeah. the law of attraction but the one thing that was brilliant in there is they said if you had for example a, a piano and you play the d chord and there was a guitar in the corner if you kept playing the d chord eventually that guitar will start playing the d chord without even touching it because the vibration of it and I realized oh, you can hear, is that true? You can that hear, is true. Oh, wow. And so the whole idea is whatever you seek is seeking you. So the vibration you put out. Have you ever noticed that you could be in the greatest mood in the world and you go in the grocery store and you go, gosh, everyone's in a great mood. Other times you go to the grocery store and go, God, everyone's a craphead today. It's you. Because <laughs> what happens, it's a reflection. It's a mirror what it is. There's a quote that says, we all need mirrors to remind us who we are. Because the vibration that we're putting out is exactly what we're getting back. Wow. So this was going to be a short podcast today. We're going to have a part two, you and I. Of all the events my wife has ever been to, she told me Greg Reed presenting at the Risk On Conference is what you did last May. And the feedback I had from everyone was that you were their favorite person. And if you look at the list of people on the list there, we're talking some elevated talent there. I mean, there are some of the... Hall of Famers and, and, you know, TV stars and business stars. Mm. And um, so where'd you get the energy? Like, when did, when, how did you become Greg Reed? 
just by being myself. <laughs> That's the day it happened. I remember one time I met a gentleman named Brian Tracy. He's an old sure. wow. sales yeah, legend, yeah, yeah, right? Of course. And so I go, Brian, I go, what's it like being you? And he goes, great question. Don't be me. I went, what? He goes, don't be Zig Ziglar. Don't be Tony Robbins. Just be you. Mm -hmm. Just like your mom taught you, people love you the way you are. Right. And that sat with me. And I says, you know what? I'm going to get rid of the monkey suits and I'm going to start wearing the clothes that I would normally wear. And I'll just start speaking from the heart and I'll come from a student's mindset mm -hmm. instead of a guru of you should do this, you should do this. It's more of, Hey, I just discovered the CPC thing. Let me share it with you. And all of a sudden we're all going on the journey together. And sure. I think that's why we connect with the audience because we're just sharing story. Someone wants to follow you. Where do they follow you at? Instagram. Go to Greg S. Reed. And I know we're going to close up, but I want to share my favorite story of all time. Do you mind? Sure. Evander Holyfield, the boxing legend. Yes. I asked him, I said, how did you win more heavyweight championships than anyone? And he looked at me and said, I have a higher standard. I said, what? He goes, in sports, I showed up early. I left late. I invented exercises. I had a higher standard and I won more championships than anyone. I said, but didn't it hurt being in a fight? He says, yeah, but when you're in a fight, you don't focus on the pain. You don't focus on the blows. As soon as you focus on the pain, you end up on your back knocked out. But that's what people do outside the ring. They focus on gas prices, war, economy, and then they wonder why they never become a champion. And he pulled me in tight, this Adonis of a man missing half an ear, but not by Tyson. He says, you know what the funny thing is? He says, when you do win the championship, he says, everyone comes to their feet and they chant your name. They raise your hand in victory, and the guy puts a big shiny belt around your waist. He said, at that moment and at that second, you don't feel even one of the punches you took along the journey. But the guy in the losing locker room will have every bruise, every excuse for the rest of their life, wishing they had a higher standard. Wow. Yeah, I got to hang around you more. All right, check out Secret Knock. Go to secretknock.co. It's March 21st to the 23rd. Apparently, there's 18 tickets left. I'd move quickly. And since this is recorded, you're going to see it in a couple of weeks. You might be out of luck. Uh, but I'll be there. Um, my team will be there. We, I guess we won't have cameras, but I look forward to seeing you there. I have this feeling we're going to see a lot more of you. I have a feeling you and I are going to attract the best of a credible source. I do. I do agree. Thanks, everybody. Hey, thanks, Greg, for being here. Um, for coming up from, uh, well, where you live is God's country. Everyone, take care. We'll see you again. Bye. You know, I'm going to explain to you real quick. Can you walk in? But don't be rolling yet. There's a reason for it. So, so I did get that right. I did get that right. I did get that right.